Turn your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 27. Is <clears throat> Linda already got the little ones in going? Yeah. Okay. Jeremiah 27. <clears throat> Something interesting I found <clears throat> a few weeks ago, and I just want to touch on it today. Um, judgment versus grace. I'm finding even though uh, the Old Testament had a lot of law in it, there was still grace. In the Old Testament. The Bible says Noah found what in the eyes of the Lord? Grace. grace. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. <clears throat> now, in the New Testament, you see that, let me say it this way, the Old Testament is the New Testament what? Concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So, <clears throat> even though the New Testament is a new covenant. There are similar things that happen in both places. The Bible says in the New Testament that his judgments are under victory. Another place that says his judgments, speaking of God's judgments, are unto truth. So, <clears throat> let's take the cross. Uh, let me, let's go back in time. Thank you for all the lights. Well, uh, just, how many enjoyed the the lights down a little more dim for worship. Enjoyed that? Okay. We just experimented today. And uh, I just used to what do it. What do it. So, <laughs> I like that. I think everybody is. So next time, let's try it again, Angel. <clears throat> anyway, uh, when the children of Israel left Egypt, what was the thing that there's a Pharaoh wouldn't let them go? And did you know that was God's plan too? God worked in that. But, the last straw that finally he let him go was what? The death angel. Okay? And uh, they had to do something to their door. Chris? Put a lamb's blood over their door. They had to put a lamb's blood over the door and on what? Both sides. Both sides. Now that didn't mean much to me when I read that in the Old Testament. But when I read in the New Testament and Jesus says, that he is the door, oh, it finally dawns on me. He is the, the real door. He's the real lamb that was slain. And since the blood was on both sides of the door, it was on both sides of Christ. So his blood not only flowed forward, his blood flowed back. Amen. It flowed all the way back to Adam. If it, in fact, is still flowing forwards today for the little baby who's born this morning yes. Jesus blood flow is still good for him right mm -hmm. even though it happened 2,000 years ago what we didn't believe for many 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 years was that his blood flowed all the way back to Adam so all those people was drowned in the flood God had a bigger picture Matter of fact, over in the New Testament, Peter says that Jesus went and preached to those people that was Noah's day. Now, why would Jesus preach to those in Noah's day? If Jesus preached to those in Noah's day, now he's supposed to be in the grave, right? When Jesus died, he was in the tomb. But the Bible says he descended to the lower parts of the earth. And when he descended to the lower parts of the earth, Peter comes along many, many years later and tells us he preached to those people in Adam's day. So he is preaching to all those folks that died in the flood. So from God's perspective, he had a bigger plan, right? He knew that they wouldn't be eternally dead forever. Yes, amen. I thought that was good. Now, in Jeremiah 29, we have a setting here. In, verse, in chapter 29 of Jeremiah, verse 1, <clears throat> here Jeremiah has sent a letter to all those folks that Nebuchadnezzar had taken captive. He took the priests, the, the prophets, the, uh, the, uh, all the government leaders, all the skilled laborers and craftsmen, and took the whole bunch of them to... to to, uh, captivity and Jeremiah is sending letters by a couple fellas named Eli, Eli, 
E L A S H E L A S A H Elasa and Gamara. Those are the two guys that took the letters. And in verse 4, it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, notice, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. Okay, get the picture? Yes. They've been carried away to Babylon, and God says, I caused that to happen. Okay? Let's read on. Now, here's what the letter said. While you're down there, build your houses, plant gardens, take wives, have sons and daughters, <laughs> encourage your kids to get married and have kids. You see, it was a thing in the, in the Old Testament it, among Israelites to populate uh, wherever they were at. Now, so they did all of that. And it goes on to say, uh, and pray for the folks down there, Babylon. Pray for their well-being. <coughs> and we get over to verse 11. It says, um, no, verse 10. It says, For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at, Bab at Babylon, I will visit you. The message, Bible says, and not one day before. In other words, <coughs> you're going to be down there in Babylon for 70 long years working for those folks. And he said, then I'll visit you after 70 years and perform my good word towards you and causing you to return to this place where you were. Now notice what God says here. Verse 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. <laughs> thoughts of what? Peace and not of evil. To give you an expected end or to give you a future. It seemed all through Israel's history, when they disobeyed God, that was God's way of punishment. Okay. Uh, let's read on. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray to me, and I'll hearken to you, and you shall seek me and find me when, she, when you shall search for me with all your hearts. And I'll be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations, from all the places. Notice, whether I have driven you, saith the Lord, and I'll bring you back to the place which I caused you to be carried away captive. I'll bring you back home. He has an intent. If you can't follow God... then you can go in captivity. <coughs> Let's get this down where the rubber meets the road. It's kind of like this. Donnie's my buddy. I'll use Donnie over here. I tell you, me and Donnie have a good time. He drives my pickup. He drives my car. And, and uh, he helps me split wood. And, and, look, the old man don't wear out as quick as he does. <laughs> I got way to go split and hammer the other day. He said, oh yeah, I'll show you how to do it. And he takes a split and hammer like this. He sick that thing from down his butt and he goes over like it about two, four or five times. He, he'd already hurt his back. And I said, and then just bouncing off the stick, I said, you want the old man to show you how to do this? <laughs> he, he said, yeah, old man, go ahead. <laughs> so we have a good time. <coughs> Here's what God is saying in that scripture. Here's how we understand it today. If you don't listen to mom, and you do your own thing, you have problems. And more problems. And more problems. And the Lord will let that happen. And see, when you get over here, you should insist, do do, do that you have to say, Mom was right. I'm sorry. You know, guess what? It all comes back. And you come back again. That's just the way the Lord works it. Now, in the New Testament, it's a little different. God's not interested in killing folks in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, enemy nations would come in and kill thousands of those Israelites. That's why they had to populate so much all the time, because there's so many of them getting killed when they get disobedience. Now, Jesus took that on himself in the New Testament. 
but he still has, that doesn't mean we're got free when we're dis when we disobey. I'm going to show you something else. These people, off, they were off in, in uh, Babylon, and after 70 years, they started participating with Babylonian ideas and pagan worship. Notice over in ver at chapter 32, I believe it's chapter 32. Uh, let me see. Okay, in, verse, in chapter 32, they start, you know, because the Babylonians do it, the Israelites have started burning their own kids as a sacrifice to an idol. You know, this is why God was always against mixed marriages in the Old Testament. Because when they had mixed marriages, the pagans never worshipped God. So God would say, don't marry those folks down there. Marry your own race. Because the pagans are going to teach you to worship idols. That was the reason for it in that day. Now they were burning their own kids. And look at verse 34. But they set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name. Had, in other words, their idols had idols set up in temples of worship. And they built the high places of Baal, which are, the which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire into Molech. Notice what God says, which I commanded them not. Neither came to my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. God said, it was never in my mind that they should ever do this. That's the pagans for you. But in the New Testament, Jesus said, uh, he took all of that, everything that Donnie had coming, everything that Papa had coming, everything that Carla had coming, in the fact that we were disobedient, Jesus took it on himself. So let's look at John chapter 12. And since you kids are going to be in here today, we're going to make it real short for you. Okay? John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John 12. Chapter 12, verse 31. Jesus is on his way to the cross. He says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Prince is the first in rule, the concordance says, or the, uh, the first in order, which we would call Satan. That's what happened after the fall in the Garden of Eden. Satan became, took the place of that, that Adam had. Adam had all rule, all authority. I mean, he was so smart. He named every animal. He named them according to their nature. Now, I think he goofed up on the mosquito. I think he should have just went like that and been done with that one. But, <laughs> but it, I guess it has its place in the echo chain, you know. So anyway, he says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Not cast, not annihilated, but cast out of his place. Now is Satan, we call it Satan, cast out of his place. He, he was ruler, and up until the death, burial, and resurrection, he's no longer ruler. It was after the death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus said, All power is given me in what? Heaven and in earth. Not the devil has a part of it, but all power is given me in heaven and in earth. Then it says, Jesus said in Matthew 5, to love your enemies. Isn't that different? It was a little different in the New Testament to love your enemies. How can you love your enemy? <coughs> now let's think about that. And I, I've got a, a message I'm working on for next Sunday about the enemy has a place. I mean, I'm a good place, but, but uh, you know... If you don't have 
How can I say this graciously? And I'm not, don't take this out of context. I'm not wanting you to have pain. But if you didn't have pain, you wouldn't know the victory. Right? If you didn't have some setbacks once in a while, you wouldn't know how to overcome. Now, I've said for a long time, pain is not our problem. Pain is a messenger. It only sends a message that there's something wrong. And I've had no telling how many people to pray <coughs> for God to, to take the pain away. That's not the issue. The pain is just a messenger saying there's a problem here, 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 wherever it's at. We need to deal with the, the core of the problem, right? But how can we love our enemy? I'm still trying to wrap my mind around that one. You know, sometimes Terry, I'd rather bless him with a brick. You know? <laughs> but, you know, love may not be the same kind of love that I have for my wife or my daughter. But being vindictive is what's bad. I laughed at Daryl and the boys come in last night and Brett <coughs> shut the door and Brett was trying to come right in behind him. I said, Brett, or Blake. I said, Blake, Brett's right behind you. He said, I know, and he shut the door in front of me. I said, well, you don't need to be vindictive. Be the man, be the bigger person. He's my grandpa. He shut the door on me. <laughs> he just kept walking. I said, okay, whatever. <clears throat> but it's being non-vindictive. You know, if you don't fight an enemy, let me say it another way. If you fight an enemy, it only gives that enemy energy. Paul said, when you've done all to stand, stand. I've learned since that's a military word, stand. When you've done all to stand, just keep standing. Sometimes you just outlast them. The enemy says, I give up whatever the enemy is. And I, I got a message next Sunday. I hope you don't, you don't miss it because um, we have a terminology. We think enemy is always the devil. But we're going to find out there's a lot of enemies that's not the devil. Matter of fact, we just, we just found out here that he's been cast out. Now the judgment of this world, Jesus speaking, now shall the prince of this world be cast out. But Brother Mike, you don't know what I know about the devil. Well, you know, it's amazing. Just turn on preachers on the radio. It's amazing how much they all know about the devil. I was talking to one on the TV the other day. He just preached around. I said, tell me about God. Amen. The guy don't even go to church knows all of that. Yes. A person just recently told me, he said, you don't go, you're not going to preach on sin? I said, let me ask you something. If you sin, do you, do you know it? Or does it, or does it kind of creep up on you and you don't even know it? And this person said, yeah, I know it. I said, you don't need a preacher then, do you? I said, I've just chosen... To preach the goodness of God, I have chosen to tell the other side of the story. I have chosen to tell how God sees you, not how I see you. I see you messing up. I see you failing. I see you getting kicked out of school. Or I see you losing your job. I see all that. God sees you. He's my kid. Let me give you another story. I read, I read this years and years ago when I still lived at Salem. Got, let's just take a smoking habit. <clears throat> I've never smoked in my life. Well, I did. I smoked a cigar one time. Missed three days of school. I was, I was probably 20 years old before I told my dad what happened. <clears throat> but anyway, this guy, he's, he's trying to quit smoking. And this guy, let's just say it's Brian. He don't smoke. Brian has... Uh, Man, he's had this urge. He wants to smoke a Marlboro so bad he can't hardly stand it. It's just the urge is on him so much and he just overcomes and he overcomes and he overcomes. And the next day, oh, it just feels so good just to light up on this morning, bright and early before I go fishing. 
oh man, I want a cigarette so bad, but he overcomes. And he has these, these uh, uh, withdrawals and these things that badger his mind maybe two or three hundred times a day. And he goes for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks into months and months and a year later he gives in and smokes one. Christian says he failed and God says, that's my man. Because he knew you don't know all the torture he went through for weeks and weeks and weeks and months and months and months and months and he never failed. That's somebody I can count him on. But the religious world says he failed. Oh, what? <laughs> I had quit and uh, I had an urge like that. And I searched the house. Uh, I remember somebody giving a cigar to a girl, you know, yeah. <laughs> looking for that to satisfy me. <laughs> well, okay. I had no idea that. <laughs> but I'm just saying, we, we tend to look at, at something that happens. We don't know the, the, pro, the, the, the situation behind it. We don't know the struggles they went through time and time and time and time again. And God looks at it like, that's my guy. That's my gal. And we said, oh, you know, that's a failure. That's why I told this person, I said, I choose to tell people who they are in Christ. God sees you as flawless. God sees me as flawless. You can see me as lots of flaws. I miss it. You know, I, I, I've, said, I've said to myself a lot of times, no more ice cream at night. But just as sure. That's the girl comes home with a box of ice cream. <laughs> and his mother is even worse. <laughs> She's got to have her chocolate ice cream. And she, she's over there dipping the other night. She said, you have it some ice cream? I said, not tonight. And I'm past that one. But two nights before, I ate a big bowl of it. <laughs> you know, I'm just saying, I just choose to tell people who they are in Christ. What, how does Christ see us? They, God sees us through the blood of Jesus. He sees us as sanctified. He sees us as reconciled. He sees us in all those things, but we see the flaws. Amen? So I choose not to bring out the flaws. You know, whatever flaw you would have, I don't see any of those, but whatever flaw you'd have, you know it. I heard somebody say the other day, everybody has a predominant strength and everybody has a predominant weakness. I, did, I hadn't thought of that, but the scripture came to me. Paul said, lay aside every weight and sin that so easily besets us. I don't know what sin Carla would have that so easily gets her off track, but there's something. It might be something the kids do. It may be something Jamie does. I don't know. Maybe just something in our own life. I don't know. But there's something with all of us. There's some little situation that we all have to deal with. Do you know what? We, have, we can't uh, afford the luxury of being with folks who pull us down all the time. We can't afford that. And I personally... I, I, when I say I love everybody, I just say, I, I do. I love everybody I've ever met. Uh, let me say it a different way. I like them. <laughs> I like them. I really do like them. I just like people. If I could, I'd take somebody in the truck with me or wherever I went. Because I like people. I like to visit. I like to share with people. I just love folks. Some folks are, are, are the other way around. They want, they want their space. You can get right in my face and talk to them. Don't bother me. Was it Donnie that we experimented in our kitchen? But, yeah. 
Donnie got across the room from me. I said, let's carry on a conversation. We carried on a conversation when it was in there. I said, let's take three steps. We took three steps towards each other, and we we started talking. Wasn't it many we did? And then we carried on some conversation, and then we got a little closer, a little closer, a little closer, and finally, we were toe to toe. <laughs> and Donnie didn't like that right in my, he didn't like me right in his face. He, he wanted his face. We did that in college. That wasn't my own idea. I learned in college, and I've learned as we got closer, the conversation got more intimate. But it wasn't very intimate when we were hollering across the room with each other. We were talking about the weather, the Royals ball game, the Chiefs. Like, the closer we got, we started talking about kids. We started talking about family. The closer we got, there's more intimate about people we like and you know that kind of thing. But, you know. I know, uh, <clears throat> I was talking to Micah last night, and he was telling me, you know, I just choose not to hang out so much with people who are not, let me say, have the same goals. Would that be a good way to put it? If you have goals in life to succeed, you can't hang out with folks who don't succeed. You gotta, Donnie, hang out with folks who are better than you. That's what my dad told me when I left home. He said, son, you be the dumbest one in the crowd. I said, wait a minute. I thought that was an insult. He later told me, he said, no, I want you to hang out with people smarter than you are. You will learn something if you hang out with people smarter than you are. And I have for the most part. My best preacher buddies are old enough to be my dad. I have a few, very few friends or preacher friends that are my age. Most of them are older than me. Because I've learned to take, <clears throat> follow their advice in many things. Not every situation works every time for everybody. But overall, I mean, so <clears throat> as you understand and love people, you start being not so vindictive with people who are against you. When you set a goal to be something, there's always an enemy to that. So there's, there's pressure against you constantly. I'm going to tell you something. God is always faithful. Uh, Sharon, in, in closing, uh, let's look at Matthew 18, Ludin. This scripture I don't like at all, but it's still true, and I have to live by it. And... In chapter 8, uh, <coughs> do look right. Matthew 18, here we go. Matthew 18. And I'll tell you the story, whether someone has to read it all. <coughs> but we find a fella that owed <coughs> two, one guy owed another guy some money. You remember the story now? He owed him a quite a bit of money. And... Uh, the guy forgave him of his debt. Big sum of money. Well, the guy that forgave him, let's just say, uh, we'll use Golden and, and Micah since uh, Golden and Micah sit down. Please. Get over a little bit there. Give him some room. i got to illustrate this. All right. This is the rich guy. But Micah has borrowed a big amount of money, and he can't pay it. And he goes to Golden and says, will you forgive my debt? I'm just cutting through a lot of chase here to get to it. <coughs> he said, yeah, I'll forgive you. Well, Micah finds Donnie. Donnie owed him a little bit of money. And he said, Donnie, you got to pay it. He asked for forgiveness. So Micah starts choking him. <laughs> he says, man, you got to pay me. <laughs> He said, you got to pay me. And Micah starts choking him. He says, you're going to pay the debt. Now, Jesus is telling this story. And he says, reminds Micah what Golden did for him. But Micah don't give up. He's just, he's choking Donnie. And he says, you're going to pay me or else. Now, that's the bad crux of the story. Now, notice in verse, um, verse 32. 
verse Matthew 18, 32. Then his Lord, after he had called him, said to him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee of all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had it on his? That's, that's golden talking. <laughs> and the Lord was wroth and delivered him to the what? Tormentors. Tormentors till he paid all that was due unto him. Here's what gets me. But it's still true. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also to you if from your hearts, if ye from your heart forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. <coughs> now, another place it says he's got to pay the utmost part of it. He's got to stay there until it's all paid. Now, sometimes we wonder why we get in the jam we get in and we don't get out immediately. <coughs> Maybe it's we're reaping what we sow. Paul said, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever a man soweth that shall he also what? Reap. Reap. And then it goes on to say, And be not weary in well doing, because you'll reap if you what? Faint not. So it's important to sow good seeds. If, you're, if bad seeds pay off, good seeds pay off. Amen. So sow good stuff. Donnie, always sow good seeds. Let me say it another way. Sow good deeds. When people say, hurt <coughs> their things towards you, you got to let it roll off. If you don't, you'll be 25 and you won't be any better off than you are today. You'll be 35 and you'll still be struggling. You're too good for that. Chris, you're too good for that. God wants you to be somebody. Because you know what? God lives in you and He lives in Donnie. He lives in all of us. Amen? So let's give Him place. In Matthew 12, back up a few pages and we'll close with this one. God has a judge in our life. <coughs> Every one of us. Donnie has a judge. I have a judge. Golden has a judge. Bronner has a judge. In verse 36, said, Jesus said, But I send you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Now, I don't know about you, but for years and years and years and years, I always thought the day of judgment was judgment day at the end of the world. Anybody felt like me in the past? Okay, I'm not up here by myself. <clears throat> but I just didn't read the next verse. The day of judgment is, is today. Sunday. What is today? Today. 13th. 13th. Sunday the 13th is judgment day for me. It's judgment day for you. Tomorrow will be judgment day for you. This afternoon will be judgment day for you. Because notice here who the judge is. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Who takes the gavel at a court of law and hits the desk? The judge. Well, the Bible says here, your words are that. Your words are the judge. So if you... That every idle word, every... Uh, I was preaching in Old Mexico and I... And my... Was you there, Carla? The, the interpreter... Uh, I said... Uh, I preached and I said... Jesus said, every idle word that men shall speak, and he shook his head. <laughs> he said, there's no word in Spanish for that. <laughs> idle. And I said, I said non-productive. Man picked it up right then and went right on with it. Every non-productive word, men will give account for it. For by your word, your words will justify you. Let me say it another way. Your words set you free, or your words put you down. Your words set you free or your words condemn you. By your words, the words that you speak is your judge. It's not at the end of the world. It's the end of your breath. 
whatever you say. You know, in Mark chapter 4, Jesus said, you can say this mountain, be thy room, cast in the sea. If you believe in your heart and you don't doubt, but you believe what you say. Some people just rattle off stuff and, you know, I'm glad they don't believe everything they say. But think about it. How do you use God's name? One of his names is I am. If you didn't have a cent in your pocket, don't say I'm broke. Because God's not broke. There's a lot of ways to take the divine energy that comes into you and speak positive. Speak the life of God. I may not have anything in my wallet, but thank God this is not the end of the story. This is not the end of the story. I don't know how God will do it. It's like Brahma last, last Sunday at the grocery store. God was setting it up. He even had a guy in line. That guy could have checked out an hour before her. But God detained him somewhere or another until he could get right behind her in line. When we pray and ask God to help us, let's don't be so <coughs> A guy came in and I passed it to Salem. He said, Brother Mike, look what I got. And I wasn't even expecting it. I said, my goodness, what would you got if you'd been bleeding for it? <laughs> you know? But we do get some unexpected things, right? That's the goodness and grace of God. Hallelujah for that. But you know, such a heart out there to say the right things. Say the things that are are honorable. Say the things that bless others. Bless your enemies. Amen. The Bible, we just read there in, in Jeremiah 29, the prophet said, pray for those down there waiting in captivity. Pray for their well-being. When I'm in a distressful situation, and I've been in some since last year, uh, it took some thinking how I'm going to pray and thinking how I'm going to say some things. Because I had a lot of chances and opportunities to say the wrong thing. And I did occasionally. And Linda would say, you want me to agree with that? <laughs> I'd say, no. You know, when we first started this years ago, Daryl could catch the most, most negative little thing I'd say. I think I, I was hitting 100, you know. Man, I'm saying the right thing, and Daryl would say, Dad, you want me to agree with that? You remember that time? He said, you want me to agree with that? I said, agree with what? Well, you just said so. No, I don't want you to agree with that. <laughs> well, don't say it then, you know. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> you don't want to go into captivity. You don't want to go into correction mode all the time, Amen. In the New Testament, that's what happens. God's not interested in killing folks. He's interested in killing the stuff in folks. That's not of Him. So, love your neighbor. Love your enemies. In this respect, at least in this, don't be vindictive back. Don't be vindictive back to them. Amen. Uh, the Lord just remind me of something I didn't do. We was leaving town here a while back, and we chased our post, our uh, our mailman down, our mail lady down. She was about ten streets over from us, <coughs> and we said, "Is there any way you can get our mail out of there? I know you're not even close to our house." And she said, "Sure." So she dug through all our mail, found ours, and I said, "I'm going to buy you some cookies." And I haven't done it yet. The Lord just, why would the Lord remind me of something just like that on Sunday morning while I'm preaching? Because that's important that I be faithful to my word. You just brought it up. I've got to buy her some cookies. I haven't done make her <laughs> You know why I'll probably buy it? Why would I buy them rather than make them? Because it's sealed. She'll feel better about it. You know, but the hard work of Linda going to trouble do it would seem like a better thing. If she does well, that'd be a different case. Anyway. Well, I hope you got something out of this today. I hope you see that in the New Testament we still have um, we have when we disobey, 
there's there's problems to pay. But it isn't <coughs> after we die, and I didn't mention that too much today, or any at all, after we die, hell for 60 billion years. Amen? It's right then. Our words justify us or our words condemn us. Don't let your words put you in prison. I mean, if you want to do something better financially, begin to speak that. I've got a big old deal on my mirror at home. I, I pray it every day, every night. Thank the Lord I'm an extravagant giver. That's the first thing on my list. Thank you, Lord. My mortgage is paid. Thank you, Lord, that our church mortgage is paid in full. Thank you, Lord, the property is saved in Houston is selling for a good price. On and on and on. You know, I want to keep those things alive and working in me till I don't have to look on the mirror, look on that paper hanging on my mirror to read it, to know it. It'll just be so in me. I'll say it going down the road. I'll say it going to the store. I'll say it coming to worship. You know, these are things that you just got to build yourself up because you don't... We're, we're all very... I guess I shouldn't say y'all. I tend to be slothful. And I tend to, if things are going good, just ride along with it. My bills are, if my bills are paid, I'm not on welfare, and I got a little gas in my tank, I'm happy. You know, and that's good, <coughs> but my goals are higher than that. I said, Sharon Michael last night, my goals is to give everywhere I go. And until that happens, I'm not I'm not totally satisfied. I do I do at least twenty percent on my activity on my when I go out and eat or more. That's a start for me. I don't try to figure it right down to fifteen percent. I always do twenty or more. And uh, that's not a lot. It's a start. I get candy out some places. Just, you know, a little piece of candy gets a smile. You know, just, I like people to, to feel better about themselves. And sometimes I'll say, what are you doing this for? I hope I just because I wanted to. And I got a smile back. One, uh, the one guy said, I said, you know, it didn't cost me much for this, but you smiled back at me. And I said, you know, the Bible says, give and shall be given. Good measure, press down, shake them together, and running over, shall be given to your bosom. I said, you know what? I get some of those unexpected things that I didn't pray for, didn't ask for, come along. When you, when you take a semi <coughs> to a garage for $105 an hour and they work on their truck and when you go pay the bills at night, you know what I mean? Now that don't happen all the time. It's happened <coughs> twice. One time we worked on three days. Two guys. And he said, no, just come back next time. Well, guess what? I'll be back next time. And I have been twice since. But <laughs> anyway, you just don't, those things just don't happen in the real world. You know? And I just thank God. That's, that's the hand of God. And I'm very appreciative. And I let them know I'm very appreciative. I said, I don't want to be back. I'll tell other folks. I don't tell other folks what they did for me necessarily because they'll think that's sin. That's the hand of God. You know? So be if be a grateful person. Don't be grateful in everything in your life. And I thank you. You pretty pretty well voiced that. Carla gets on TV with you and says, Yes, sir. yes, ma'am. <laughs> God bless you. Let's stand. <laughs> And you that don't know Donnie, uh, just please understand he's my buddy. You don't think I'm picking on Donnie because uh, you pick on him, you got me to fight. <laughs> Amen. I love Donnie. I love all these boys. Chris, love you, buddy. I'm glad you came today. And uh, I want you to know God loves you whole bunch, more than you probably love yourself. Okay? Amen.
Have a great week. Anybody have any questions? Okay, shake hands with me, friendly. We're back next Sunday. Oh, that I means Brenda's. Brenda's uh, funeral, or uh, uh, I didn't tell the date. It's, it's this coming Saturday? Next Saturday. March 26th. That's the Saturday before Easter Sunday. Down at Boston, Missouri. I think it's about 260 miles or something like that down there. But anyway, uh, if any of you can go, it would be wonderful. If you can't go, we understand. God bless you. Have a beautiful day.